Lord Jesus, I pray that you just guide this message. This is a hard text. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will just work in a powerful, mighty way so that each person who listens to this message, those who are in-house, those who are online, those, those who re-watch it six months from now, that they will come away with what you want them to know, God. It's all about you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So we are continuing our series called Dinner with Jesus. Um, Jesus did some really powerful ministry around the meal. Um, I would say around the table, but you know, last week we were, we were having a picnic with Jesus, so there were no tables. Today we're back to the tables. But Jesus um, had awkward meals, he had convicting meals, he had endearing encounters at his meals, kind of all of the above. And, and what's interesting about that is in the ancient Near East, first century Palestine, who you ate with really mattered. Like, today we can go to lunch with people and it doesn't matter if that we can be very different from them. Um, we don't think much about it. At that time, it really mattered. Um, it, who you broke bread with was an indication of the people you accepted into your life, the people that you connected with. And um, so devout Jews would only eat with other devout Jews. They would never, ever consider inviting a Gentile to their table or anyone who was, who was sinful or, or unclean in any way. And so, of course, Jesus, as he often did, he turned this all upside down, right? He invited all kinds of different people to his table. And it was shocking. It was scandalous, even, um, who Jesus brought to dine with him. And it said a lot about who he is, said a lot about what he valued and what we are to value as well. So we're joining Jesus um, for another really awkward dinner um, experience. You may recall two weeks ago, there was a super awkward dining experience, something about eating with Jesus. He can make it, he can make it really awkward um, because he doesn't beat around the bush. He says things like they are. And, and let's be honest, that makes a lot of us feel uncomfortable, Right? So this is one of those situations that if I were at this dinner table, maybe as another one of the guests, kind of witnessing what happens, I would feel very uncomfortable. I'd probably try to slip out the back door. Or maybe I would, I would say, please excuse me, I need to use the restroom. And I would stay in there as long as I possibly could before they start worrying about me, right? It's one of the, it's that kind of dinner party. Have you ever been to a dinner party like that where you just were like, how do I get out of here? So, What's interesting about tonight, uh, this, the, this evening's meal with Jesus, is that he's been invited to another home of a Pharisee. You might recall the first evening meal he had was with a Pharisee that we talked about. It's another Pharisee. And we're in Luke chapter 11. And if you take a look at that whole chapter, Jesus has spent a lot of time preaching and teaching. And it's somewhere in the midst of that preaching and teaching that he's met this Pharisee. Now, if you recall, Pharisees were a group of very devout Jews who really believed in keeping the law very precisely. And they were very concerned with the purity laws in particular. And they felt like keeping these purity laws was what made them acceptable in God's sight. So we tend to look at the Pharisees as self-righteous jerks, right? But they thought that what they were doing was bringing themselves closer to God. They thought that they were doing the right thing. So in today's text... We have no sign that this Pharisee is trying to trick Jesus or manipulate Jesus in, in any way. He hears Jesus' teaching and he's intrigued. And he wants to invite Jesus into his home so they can have an evening of good old religious debate. You know, doesn't that sound appealing? It's what we all want around our dinner table. But in that culture, at that time, that would have been normal. So I want us to dig into the scripture. Now, keep in mind, this is a very long scripture passage. So I'm going to break it into pieces and... Um, 
And if you would like, it may be helpful if you pull out your own Bible to Luke chapter 11, if you have that. If not, you can follow along with me on the screen. Luke 11, starting with verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and he reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. So we mentioned the Pharisee invites Jesus to his home. They're getting ready to recline at the table. Remember, they didn't sit in chairs like we think about. They um, kind of are almost in a laying down position at a very low table. But before they do that, Jews would always do this ceremonial hand washing. And Jesus didn't do it. He just goes ahead and reclines. And it says that the Pharisee was shocked, astonished, that Jesus didn't do this hand washing. Now, keep in mind, this was 2,000 years before germ theory. So it wasn't like they were washing their hands with soap and water to kill the bacteria and the viruses that they had gathered, getting all those good germs off like we would do. No, it had nothing to do with hygiene at all. What happened at the time is that Jews would pour water on their hands, and it would symbol- the idea was it would symbolically remove the defilement from being outdoors in a sinful world. So they would take a pitcher of water and they would pour it over one hand and then they would pour the water over the other hand. And all of this was very prescribed. It was very specific how they would engage in the ceremonial hand washing. So Mark's account of the same meal adds a little more detail. Mark chapter 7 verses 3 and 4. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So where does this come from? Basically, um, In the Old Testament, the law doesn't have a lot of details. So if you read through the Old Testament law, you that gives basic general guidelines, but it doesn't have specifics. So what the the rabbis and the the, um, law experts did is they created specifics. And so they they those are found in the Talmud. It's T-A-L-M-U-D, which is the traditions of the elders, so guidelines to follow to keep very specific purity rituals. Now, in the minds of devout Jews, it was religiously following these rules that made them acceptable to God. Okay, verse 39. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside... You are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Jesus gets right to the point, doesn't beat around the bush, right? So he says, to this Pharisee. He's like, you guys care so much about the outside. You you care so much about following these outward rules about being religious that you're not paying any attention to the inside, to your heart. Sure, you look great on the outside, but your insides are filthy. What you do isn't what makes you acceptable to God. God cares about your heart. God cares about your heart. And Jesus is clear. Something had gone wrong in their heart. Something had gone wrong in the heart of hearts of these Pharisees and experts in the law. They were clueless. Verse 39 says that they are full of greed and wickedness. And they they think they're doing the right thing. They think They are doing the right thing for God. They are totally missing the point. So Jesus speaks these six woes against them. Now, woes, we know about woes from the book of Revelation. 
but we also find them in the book of Luke. And woes are judgments um, against someone, really almost like a curse. And they typically signify impending doom or God's wrath. So if something signifies impending doom or God's wrath, I think we should pay attention. Just, just a thought there. In, so in the Greek, if you go back to the ancient Greek, the woes have to do with, they're actually statements of pain and anguish. So I want you to picture as Jesus is saying these, he's anguished. Like this is painful to him to have to do this. Now, this is really heavy stuff. I just, for, fair warning, it's really heavy stuff. So it's helpful to me if every time I say, woe, like woe to the Pharisees, that you guys say, whoa. All right, so let's practice. Woe to the Pharisees. Whoa. Good job. Okay. That way I know you're awake and you keep me awake too. See how it works? Great. Verse 42. Woe to you, Pharisees. Whoa. Perfect. Because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. You see, Basically, Jesus is saying, you love your religion more than you love God and neighbor. So the Pharisees were so religious, and they have all these really specific religious rules. So much so, they don't just tithe their income. They tithe their herb gardens, okay? So who, who in here has an herb garden? A few people. Can you imagine having to... Um, very specifically measure out 10% of your mint and your basil and your oregano and bring that to the temple. Now, I want you to tithe, but please don't bring us your herbs, okay? I'm not quite sure what I would do with those. Um, unless it's basil. I go through a lot of basil. Um, right, Sam? The only thing that lives in our garden is a basil. Um, so... So they're tithing 10% of their herb gardens, which is a bit extreme. But it says they treated people poorly. They neglected the poor, and they didn't care for their neighbor. So they didn't really love God. They loved the idea of God. Okay, this is where it's going to get personal. Okay, you ready? Y'all, we do a lot of religious stuff. I do a lot of religious stuff. My whole life is about doing religious stuff, right? And just like the Pharisees, we have our own religious busyness. We do. We prepare for church services. And then we prepare some more for church services. And then we have our church services. And we like things done a certain way. We go to Bible studies. We go to small groups. We do religious stuff. And none of that's bad. Doing religious stuff is not bad as long as our hearts are right with God. Amen? Because that's what God cares about. He cares about our hearts. God could care less about how we look on the outside. You know, we can look so good to our church friends, but if something is wrong with our heart, then none of that matters. Then none of this stuff matters at all. And we are totally missing the point. We might as well be running on a hamster wheel because we're getting nowhere. So if we're doing all this religious, churchy stuff, and then we leave this building and we mistreat our family, or we are ugly to the waitress at Jesse's, or we are dishonest at work, or we talk trash about a church friend, then something is wrong. And Jesus is clear. Jesus isn't saying, make sure you get all your religious stuff right. Make sure you get all your religious rules right. Make sure you get your doctrine perfect. Make sure you attend at least two Bible studies a week and everything will be clean for you. That's not what he says. Look, the scripture says um, that Jesus says, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. 
So if we appear to do the right religious things, but we don't really love God and love others, then we are totally missing the point. Amen? None of this matters. None of this, look around this sanctuary. None of this matters if our hearts aren't right with God. We are kidding ourselves. Verse 43, woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. So the most respected rabbis and teachers and elders would have chairs at the front of the synagogue. And I'm sure some of you have been to kind of older churches where they have chairs at the front of the churches. You know, sometimes they're those wooden chairs and they're pointy on the top, they look so uncomfortable. But I mean, even old Methodist churches, right? You'd have the chairs in the front of the sanctuary, and that's where the pastors sat. Now, is there anything wrong with sitting in the front of the church? No. But it's sitting up front to be seen by others, right? It's when, when it becomes a prideful thing. And the Pharisees loved to sit up front, because then the people could see how important they were, how spiritual they were, how religious they were, how close to God they were. They liked to receive their special honorary greetings in the marketplaces. I'm not exactly sure what those are, but hi, Rabbi so-and-so, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's similar if you saw me in Publix, right? Hi, Pastor Vicky. Fast forward to today. So generally, we don't have special reserved seats at church, correct? Correct. I got on some people at the early service. No one has their spot in church. All right. Making sure everybody's on board with that. But... <laughs> That was, that was a good woe. But if we are walking around thinking that we are better than other people because we are Christians, then we have a problem. If we are walking around thinking that I'm a better Christian than that lady over there, then, then we have a problem, right? And here's one that cuts pretty deep for me as a pastor. If I'm up here and I'm thinking that I'm better than others because I'm standing here, that I'm holier, that I... If I want to impress other people rather than God, then that indicates a serious heart problem. Yeah. And I'm guessing, I said this earlier, but the praise team, like it's the same kind of issue that you have to be so very, very careful. Um, you know, are we, are we singing for, for man's praise or for God's praise? You know, if, whatever, if we're doing this for the wrong reasons, if you are serving where you are serving for the wrong reason, then we're totally missing the point. And woe to us. Y'all are getting good at this. <laughs> Verse 44. Woe to you. Because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. So in Israel, some of you have seen the gravestones in Israel. Um, Sam and I actually walked through some um, cemeteries, didn't we? Um, it's fascinating. They're gorgeous because everything is whitewashed. It's beautiful. Like they're bright. And so... That's what they're referring to in the scripture. But they weren't whitewashed and bright and like super shiny clean, so just to look pretty. They did that so that people would see them, so they wouldn't accidentally step on a grave because um, they didn't want people to contract ritual uncleanliness. Now, what am I talking about? Numbers chapter 19. In Numbers chapter 19, it says that if you touch a bone or a grave, then you're going to be unclean for a week until you go through this ritual cleansing process. So Jesus turns this upside down. He's like, you think that you're clean because you avoid stepping on these whitewashed graves? You're totally missing it. You are totally missing it. In fact, 
You are missing it so much that when people come into contact with you Pharisees, they get infected and unclean. That's how dirty your hearts are. You're worried about stepping on graves. I'm telling you, you're the one who's unclean. unclean. You're the one that's infected. You're the one that's a danger to other people. This, this, at this point, you can imagine how terribly uncomfortable this dinner party is. Verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say such things, you insult us also. And I kind of picture Jesus looking at them going, duh, (laughs) yeah, that is the point. So he says this, Jesus says, and you experts in the law, now it's your turn. Woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves would not lift one finger to help them. So these experts in the law would study the Old Testament all day long. They were the ones who created the specific guidelines that everybody had to follow to remain clean, ritually clean. Now, all the experts in the law, they would have been Pharisees, but not all Pharisees would be experts in the law. Um, Now, many of these rules that these experts would impose on people were really, really burdensome. So think about this. The average Jew, the average Jewish person in that time, was really poor. And most of them worked out in, in the field, maybe in the vineyard or in some other kind of agriculture. And they they literally lived hand to mouth. So they would go out, they would work in the field, and they would get paid, hopefully enough, to buy food for their family for that day and that day alone. So literally hand to mouth. So it would be almost impossible for them to actually follow through with all these religious rules that the experts in the law were imposing on them. It was so very unreasonable. Um, and I kind of I kind of picture academia here. And y'all know I love academia. I'd gladly go get another degree if I could. But there are many times in academia where they're in their ivory towers and they say, well, this is the way it should be done. And the rest of us are like, well, that doesn't make any practical sense, right? I'm thinking seminary, Lavetta's laughing, because they'll, they'll teach you something and they'll, you'll be like, you really think that's going to go over well in the local church? Hmm. I was trying to think of something that kind of would make sense, make, might be similar for us. Um, so what if the New Hope board decided to give all of you, all the members and attenders of this church, a playbook of sorts? This is not only how to be a good Christian, but this is how to be a really good part of New Hope Church. And in this playbook, you, you're told you can only watch these specific movies, and you can only watch these specific TV shows and listen to these specific musicians. thanks Richard that's my husband by the way and then you're only you're told in this playbook you can only go to these specific restaurants and you can only eat this kind of food and these are the only kind of jobs you can work and this is a list of the what you're allowed to do for recreation And your children and grandchildren can only go to this list of approved schools, and you can only live in certain areas, and you can only socialize with certain kinds of people. So might that be a bit burdensome? And then what if you found out that I get to get get around those rules? See, all of you, you have to go to those certain restaurants, but I've gotten tired of those restaurants, so I want to go to a different restaurant, and the way I get around the rule is that I order takeout, and it's okay, (laughs) because it's me, right? So I know it's a really silly example, 
But that's kind of what was going on, right? The average Jewish peasant was being forced to follow these really difficult, challenging, cumbersome religious rules for the higher ups, these experts, they were not put out at all. In fact, they found ways around them. And this is the thing, none of it, none of this had to do with what really mattered. None of it. All of this religious busyness, they had missed the point entirely. And they were kidding themselves. They were kidding themselves. Verse 47 and 48. Woe to you. Because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. So I've kind of um, uh, s- summarized this section, because it was quite long. But basically, Jesus is saying to the teachers of the law, your ancestors killed the prophets, And you think that if you had been there, it would have been different? You think that you wouldn't have done that? So you you make these fancy tombs in honor of your ancestors and honor these prophets. And here you are in front of the prophet of all prophets, and you have rejected him. And of course, he's, he's referring to himself. And I have to admit, I was, I was looking at this, it was kind of a difficult part of the text, and I was like, ooh, I think we have to be really careful here. Because we have the tendency to think, well, if I had been there, if I had been there, I would have done it differently. I, I wouldn't have killed that prophet, I wouldn't have persecuted that person. And I think we have to be really careful It's kind of like saying, if I had been there, I never would have said, crucify him. But friends, we are weak people. We are so weak. Um, In recognizing our weaknesses and our frailties and our sinfulness is the first step, right? We have to come to terms with the fact that we are very vulnerable And our hearts allow all kinds of things to creep in, right? We are sinful people. And we need the power and strength of Jesus Christ even to have a chance for our hearts to be right with God. Amen? Amen. So I want to finish this scripture. We're going to go down to verses 52 through 54. Woe to you! experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. And when Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. So Jesus tells them, you're not helping people understand God's word. You experts in the law, you are not helping people. You are making it harder and more convoluted. And I think this is a really fair warning for all of us who are preachers and teachers and class leaders. Are we making the Bible easier or harder to understand? And and please know when we teach biblical principles and doctrine, it's not just um, what we say, but it's also what we do, how we live our lives. So this is about the time where the dinner party begins to break up, and Jesus heads outside, and they ask him a ton of questions, and then he leaves, and you can just imagine the murmuring, can you believe he said that? Can you believe it? We have got to catch him. I mean, they can't stand him. They can't stand him because they feel like he has humiliated them. They are so mad. And so they begin to think how they can oppose him, how they can catch him in his words so they can get rid of him. So what are we to make of all these woes? Oh, my God. So what are we to make of all these woes? All right. (laughs) One thing I think that God has taught me through this passage 
because it's a hard passage, isn't it? Um, is that I must humble myself and make sure my heart is right with God. Because I want us to think about this. The Pharisees thought they were doing it right. The Pharisees thought that they were doing everything that made them acceptable in God's sight. I mean, they were the righteous gatekeepers. And Jesus said, you are totally missing the point. You are totally missing the point. And what's interesting, if you read all four Gospels, Jesus saves his harshest words for whom? The religious people. He saves, he saves his harshest words for the church folks, right? And last time I checked, that's us. It's certainly me, but it's also you guys. And it is so very easy to be religious. It's a lot harder to be loving. It is so very easy to do the stuff that makes us look on the outside like we're good Christians, right? It's a lot harder to actually be a good Christian. To really, really, really love God and to really, really love others and to acknowledge that those two things cannot be separated. Jesus could care less about the outside. Jesus could care less about the outside. He doesn't care about steeples, and he doesn't care about stained glass windows. He doesn't care about the facade that we present to the world. He doesn't care if I'm wearing a skirt and heels, or if I'm wearing jeans and flip-flops. Jesus just doesn't care. None of that matters to him. What does he care about? He cares about our hearts. And y'all, he can see our hearts. He can see everything about our hearts. He knows us through and through. He knows what we value. He knows what we value. He knows what we think of others. He knows. He, He doesn't just see the outside of us. He sees us. Now, the Pharisees believed that that lie that God sees as man sees, and that's totally wrong. God sees with x-ray vision the true nature of our soul. God sees with x-ray vision the true nature of my soul. And if that doesn't make you stop in your tracks, and I'm not quite sure what will, because it makes me tremble. Because if God knows my soul, then he knows that judgmental thought I had, I don't know, 10 minutes ago. He knows my fears. He knows my lack of trust. He knows my frustration. He knows my annoyance. He knows my anger. He knows my hypocrisy. He knows that sometimes I don't want to invite anybody new to the table. He knows all of those things. I can't hide a thing from God, and neither can you. He knows my heart, and he cares about my heart. And friends, God knows your heart, and he cares about your heart. I want to be sure I'm not missing it. And as your pastor, I want to be sure that you're not missing it, too. Because, see, I want to please God. I want to please God with my whole life. There's nothing more important than to please God with my life. I want to walk closely with Jesus And this is the bottom line. We will all eventually be face-to-face with Jesus. Amen? We all will be face-to-face with Jesus. We will stand before him. And frankly, when I stand before Jesus, I don't want him to say, Vicki, you totally missed the point. So all these woes... What they teach me is that we have to look at our hearts and we have to really examine them. What is the status of your heart? So for the next few minutes, um, I'm going to close in prayer, but then I'm going to invite you to just come to the altar. And there'll be music playing. And I really just want you to think Think about the status of your heart. What have you allowed 
to enter your heart because God knows. God knows, like we can't keep it from him. Friends, nothing else matters. We, we put all this importance on things that are temporal, things that are earthly, things that will rust. And the only thing that matters is our relationship with Jesus Christ. The only thing that matters is our heart. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, and we want to please you with our life. I want to please you with my life. I want to walk closely with you. And Lord, I have fallen. I have messed up over and over again, just this morning, over and over again. Forgive me, Lord. And I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here. I pray, Lord, that we can come before you with a spirit of humility. We truly want to do better, God. God, I don't want to miss the point. And I don't want any of them to miss the point. We get so absorbed in church stuff, in busyness, that sometimes we forget why we are here to begin with. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. It's all about you. So Lord, examine our hearts and reveal to us those places that we need to work on. Convict us in a, in a way that we just, we can't stand it. Convict me in a way that I just can't stand it, that I have to do something about it. Because I stand before a holy God Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.